I'm going to share a few thoughts broadly and set the stage on systems thinking and relate that to investing and impact investing. And then we'll quickly go down the row um, with some introductions and they'll talk a little, the team, each one will talk very briefly about the work they're doing in systems change and how they apply systems thinking and one key learning. Um, and then we'll go back and forth for a little while and then we'll open it up. There's the general, the general flow. So with systems thinking, systems thinking has been around for quite a while and has been applied in a variety of different settings and it's now being applied rigor, more rigorously both academically and by practitioners to the social change space, impact space, et cetera. Um, and I'm just going to highlight three principles of systems thinking. First is interconnectedness, that everything is connected to everything else. And it sounds very Zen and Eastern, and in fact it is. It also happens to be true, um, which is great, that everything's connected to everything. And systems theory and systems thinking attempts to map those, map those connections, but most importantly, look at the interaction between the connections, the way of information or financial or power flows and imbalances and things like that as a way of understanding the system. And the basic idea is you can't understand a system from just one node because it's complex. It, multiple interactions uh, determine final results. Second is feedback loops, that there's some type of feedback loop built in to a system, to a natural system. If you think of an ecosystem or something like that when you know, um, the, the deer population gets too, too high, it eats too much food, and then it can't sustain itself the next time. There's some kind of feedback loop or the, the, the wolf population gets too high, it eats too many deer, then the wolf population can't support itself, et cetera. So a feedback loop. And then um, the, the third is emergence, that, that there's an emergent behavior that the result of the system emerges from within the system itself. It's not always, it's not linear and it's al almost not always directly um, able to be predicted. You know, it's not just one plus one equals two, it's one plus one equals horse, or it can be. Um, so those are some broad principles that I think we'll build on as, as we talk about this here. So why is this important? Why does it matter? Is this just some, you know, esoteric academic thinking applied to this space or, or what. I actually think it matters now more than ever. Because we're facing, depending on your, your point of view and where you spend your time, we're facing six, seven, eight, nine crises, like big fundamental systems level, even uh, uh, existence level crises in the world from, and I, again, don't wanna be a downer on this if you heard my talk this morning, but you know, from climate change, uh, to the, the potential threat of AI, to polarization, et cetera. Um, and I think in the impact investing space broadly, and I've been a part of it for 20 years, so I'm pointing at myself as well, sometimes we tend to get really excited about this deal that we're doing. And it's fun to talk about at Thanksgiving dinner, or it's great to have the press release or the whatever, because this deal is so exciting, and this deal is going to make these changes, et cetera. But fundamentally, if we zoom out and take a systems approach, one deal will, on its own, will rarely change too much. It will do something within the system, but not change the structure that's producing the results that we have. By the way, there's another principle. This is, uh, I don't know, you, you mentioned this in our pre-call, but our system, we have perfectly designed the, the world to give us the results we're currently getting. If you think about that for a second. We've designed things to perfectly give us the results we're currently getting. If we don't like the results, we have to go back and change the system. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about this. How do we think harder? How do we think bigger? I've found, I've been doing this type of work for almost 30 years. Um, yes, I started when I was quite young. Um, but, uh, and I found it takes about, here's another market research pulled out of my ear. Um, it takes about 20% more effort to think 100 times bigger. 20% more effort to think 100 times, it doesn't take 100 times more effort, right? I don't know, I think some of you who are doing systems work, it, it takes more effort, definitely, but it's not totally proportional. With some additional effort, we can think bigger, we can think systemically, um, et cetera. I want to, um, so with, with this, a couple more things and then we'll, we'll go to the group. Um, 
one of the things we'll see is that who we invest in or who makes the investment decision and how we make the investment in systems thinking can be at least as important in what we're investing in. Who and how can be at least as important if what, if not more important, right? Who's making that investment decision, et cetera. Um, and this, this was, I was in another, with another group uh, this week at the World Economic Forum event, and we had a presentation by one of the leading scientific technologists in the world. This is the person who helped, I shouldn't say who it is, I'm not gonna give them, make them identifiable. Um, but some of the main things that we read, if you open up, you know, X or you open up however you get your news source or whatever, things that we're reading about, this is the person behind these. Um, and they're involved in launching some things to space and doing um, low orbit uh, broadband provision through satellite networks, et cetera. And somebody asked them a question and, um, and said, uh, and said, uh, my understanding that with the you know, broadband provision down to, um, to Earth, by the way, uses radio or microwaves. So if this works, we're gonna have microwaves beamed at us all the time. Think about that and how you teach your kids not to stand in front of the microwave. Now it's just gonna be beamed at us. Um, so but that, remember that, because that's gonna be part of my point and then we're gonna go on. Um, next is, uh, someone said, I, I, I thought there's a lot of loss in transmission. And they said, well, right now, it's about 90% loss in transmission. And we can solve that, but it's actually cheaper just to put more satellites up. And it's okay because we have a lot of space out there. Um, which, if, you know, if you're just buying the kind of technology will save us line, seems great, I'll put more satellites up and everybody has broadband everywhere. Um, but I said that, I raised my hand, I said, that's kind of like what people thought when they went to the United States and thought they're limitless trees, let's just chop them down and use them. We don't have limitless resources. Um, they didn't have a fantastic answer there, but that was the point about not thinking about second, so they, they were thinking about first order impact. Let's get broadband internet to you know, rural Africa, Latin America, et cetera, places that don't have it. Not thinking about the second order impact or the third order impact, space debris, <laughs> microwaves beamed at us all the time, et cetera. So just as we go through this, you'll hear practitioners thinking through, thinking 20% harder to think 100, 100 times bigger. How do we think about second order impact and third order impact? That's setting the stage. That's probably the most you'll hear from me for the rest of this, this panel, hopefully. Um, so now let's go down. If you would just talk about quickly your name, where you are, where you work, and how briefly how you, you and your team are thinking about um, thinking about systemic change and systems level impact investing. For sure. Uh, briefly was probably meant specifically for me. I understand that, Jeff. Um, so After my five minute monologue. Anin Tanshi. Kinu Kinu Inene Indigenous. My traditional name is Eagle Man Leading. I come from um, Canada, the prairies. We call the Red River Valley. And I'm a, from the Métis, part of the Métis Nation. Uh, the historic Métis Nation there, and you know, I, I live and work in Canada. I'm the uh, co one of the co-founders and managing partners of Raven Indigenous Capital Partners, and the CEO of the Raven Indigenous Impact Foundation. We are impact investors. We are Indigenous impact investors. We have the unique and unfortunate distinction of being the only ones hmm. in North America. Just think about a system for a minute. Um, and um, how, how do we think about uh, so, and we're, we're doing a lot of work now in outcomes finance, and we're doing that work in outcomes finance, and the team is here in this room, uh, is because the systems are broken and we want, it to, we want to have different outcomes than the ones that we've been given uh, and work within. Um, we are constantly in a systems thinking modality because the systems were uh, not made favorable to our people across the globe, in particular where we work in, on Turtle Island here in North America. And uh, we believe uh, that we need to upend the system. And maybe it's a bit of subterfuge on our part. Uh, we are trying to use capital against capital. So we're trying to stop the extractive process of capital by building our own capital to work in a different way. Uh, what I just did a panel before on uh, how money can act as medicine, and we can get into more as, as we progress, but I don't want to take too much time. But when, when, we, when we do come back, let's come back in a moment, because I think um, 
the approach you're taking from an indigenous perspective, we collectively in the world lost, we gained a lot through the Enlightenment and reductionist sure. thinking that got us so far. So now we need to go back to the indigenous wisdom. So if you can tie that in when we, when we come back around, that would be really helpful, I think. For sure. That'd be great. Okay. Tell us. Um, yeah, lovely to be here, and thank you so much uh, for, for, for the session. So um, I'm Erica Bar Barbosa. I'm uh, with a company called Second News, uh, Second News Capital. Uh, I come here from, uh, I'm, I'm based out of uh, Montreal, Canada as well, first-generation immigrant, uh, originally from Bolivia, and uh, mom to a Greek-Canadian Latina <laughs> daughter, so you can de deduce the personality there. Um, mighty. Um, but um, so uh, second news, um, so we're a, a family of companies um, that is uh, really dedicated to building uh, new markets and um, by uh, with a particular focus uh, over, over the years on supporting um, economies that are in transition or in, in new development. So it leads us to focus a lot on, on supporting entrepreneurs. Um, it's, um, there's Second Muse that is an impact uh, and innovation company, so have been working really um, uh, through processes like open innovation, global hackathons, to really with the principles of, um, you know, tapping into the genius of as many minds as possible and the genius of the many to, to come up with solutions. Everything that we do has a systems, uh, sort of like systems principles under it, and so part of it is, you know, uh, experts are really good at defining problems, less good at coming up with solutions. So, uh, you know, let's let's get ma as many minds as possible to come up with better ideas and more informed. We um, second me supports about a thousand entrepreneurs every year through a range of programs, whether it's in uh, technology ecosystems promoting women in tech, advanced manufacturing, circular economy. Um, uh, digital mental health and climate are particular sectors that we work, and very much on uh, also what sounds a little bit more uh, abstract, which is uh, ecosystem development. So that's really less about working directly with entrepreneurs and supporting companies, and more initiatives in which you're coordinating the activities between different actors, whether it's public sector, with investors, with entrepreneur support organizations, and all with the intent of influencing the relationships between the actors so your ecosystems are working in more coordinated ways to create uh, economies that are more just, inclusive, resilient, and less harmful for people on the planet. And uh, Second Use Capital, that is the sister company, which is where, where I focus 100% uh, of my time, is, is really looking at the supplies, influencing the supply side of capital in line with the same principles of, of collaboration and, and, and systems development. And we are um, uh, right now building some uh, venture uh, capital funds, climate, uh, one particularly in climate. And we have uh, some services around um, advisory services for institutional uh, product development and impact investing, as well as a, a lab process by which we bring uh, investors with communities, with entrepreneurs and others to design uh, products uh, in new ways, just recognizing that it's not just about what we're investing in, but we need to rethink also some of the structures by which we're managing money uh, and, and, and investment. So, and happy to elaborate a little bit more on we'll the go deeper. program yeah. later. Thanks, Erica. Darren. Yeah, thanks. It's uh, great to be here with everyone. Um, I thought I might start with just sharing a little bit about Illumin Capital, but the way I'll do it is through sharing a little bit about uh, a mentor that I never met. Uh, a man. Does anybody know Charles Hamilton Houston? Anybody know that name? One over here. All right, all right. Two. Um, Charles, Charles Hamilton Houston uh, was dean of Howard Law School. And he thought that there was injustice in the early 40s within the education system. So he became the dean of the law school and developed a strategy of teaching a generation of law school students how to take on the system of Plessy versus Ferguson, separate but equal. And his student in the front of his class was Thurgood Marshall. And many of his students would take that on um, and challenge and overturn Plessy versus Ferguson with Brown versus Board of Education, creating integration and overturning the doctrine of separate but equal. 
which I believe, um, and part of the reason it was overturned, is it leads to greater prosperity in communities and in, in, in the country and in the world. Illumin Capital similarly takes on a system, uh, and many of us have heard earlier today, it's 1.3% of $82 trillion in capital managed by women and people of color. When we look at the system, our model is to empower a generation of managers through a cohort of fund of funds investing such that they're informed with information around bias that led to this abysmal number. And not only is it abysmal, but it's also suboptimal in terms of an investment strategy. And equip them with the ability to think at a 10x level um, differently. 10x, the, w the way that that comes into fruition is that rather than investing simply directly in companies, we're working with managers in a partnership that helps them over time see underestimated and overlooked women and people of color within global financial markets and deploy capital as such. So that's part of the way that we think about the world that we're in. We think about you know, the lineage that we, we come from and the transformative power of taking on systems. Um, I think that it's, it's interesting being here in so many different ways around, alongside of others that I really value and you know, think, think together with. And I think the system's incomplete without any of our different strategies in the fullness of what we can produce and believe. So excited for the discussion. Thanks, perfect. Let's just start, keep, if you don't mind, Darren, keep going with you. Uh, next question, talk a little bit about how you are seeking systems change. So if you can say a little more, pick, sketch for us with words the system, the capital allocation system, mm -hmm. and the intervention points that, you, just like the, the law school dean did, okay, taking a long-term view, create up a generation that's going to change the, map for us the system and how, what nodes you're working on that you think will have a ripple effect throughout. And then as part of that, tell us a little about what's been hard in doing that work. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, next I'll, I'll just borrow, I'll borrow from, from Einstein and talk about, many of you know that you, whenever you approach a problem, you take 55 sem seconds and frame the problem, and the last five seconds to solve the problem. And when we started Illumin Capital, what we did is we asked the question, basically, are people willing to give up financial performance because of their own inability to see the humanity of other people? and the value that they bring to the marketplace when race and gender are present. And we, see, we went out and tested 180 asset allocators with professors from Stanford um, and published a paper saying that, yes, people will leave money on the table rather than investing in high-performing women and people of color. So by solving that and framing the problem in a way that the financial markets would basically choke on themselves as they were trying to maximize um, financial outcomes and missing the very solutions set and people and human beings that were producing them, um, were able to at least get in and share a different perspective with some of the larger pools of capital in the world and cause um, uh, you know, a cognitive dissonance in which we can enter through a different way of thinking or idea. So the system that we're trying to, to change, ironically, claims profit maximization when it systematically overlooks and underestimates women and people of color you know, in, in its ongoing daily process. So we went after the fiduciary elements of a system that would claim one thing and then in in many systematic instances, overlook these incredibly well-performing uh, groups of folks when race was present. So we A-B tested as well um, uh, conditions where uh, it was white men and black men, you know, for example. And as we increased performance, people would select uh, white men with exactly the same performance again and again and again. 
And so then once you showed them that the underlooked allocators were outperforming, then everything changed. They said, oh, well, then we'll, we'll just do that, right? Once you show them the data, this is a softball question for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I think um, you know, a, a lot of our work is based on um, realizing, I call it show and tell, because you can tell people all day long to change their behavior and to see the research. But until you show a different way of doing things, it's very hard to realize that. And the way that we do that is that um, we bring people into community in Montgomery, Alabama, and bring them through a process of seeing the history of lynching, mass incarceration, slavery, and uh, understanding how we got to 1.4% in the global financial markets. Because only once you understand how we got there can we really begin to torque the systems of change? So the systems, as you said, and as others have said, Erica shared before, that uh, you know, systems are created to produce the outcomes that they're created to produce. So if that's true, then we have to go back in order to go forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Erica, will you give us a map, a brief mental map of the system you're working on, where you're intervening, and what, what's been hard? Yeah, um, in, so we work with, uh, uh, across the board more as an enabler for others to be able to operate within, within, a, larger, within a larger system. And just, uh, you know, following on this last point that uh, Darren uh, raised, you know, yes, systems are doing what they were designed to do, but why are they wrong to begin with? Right? And when you think about it, you know, and, 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 and I'm using an example that one of my colleagues uses um, uh, frequently, um, you know, with physical systems, it's, it's a little bit much easier to have, have some of that feedback loop. You, you, you put on wings, you jump on the cliff, and very quickly you're going to realize that something is, not wrong, and something is wrong with that, and you're going to iterate and improve on that. With social systems, it's a little bit harder to get immediate feedback loops, and you can go centuries oppressing half of humanity, and you call it progress for a long period of time. And, and part of it is just the way that we're wired as human beings, you know, as sort of like for efficiency purpose, evolutionary purposes, just the blinders that we have and the bi the, in the form of biases. And so for, for a very long period of time, uh, you know, we've been creating things by very homogeneous groups of people that just have one perspective, one life experience, um, uh, and, and has resulted in, in what we're seeing today. So one of the big important things about systems intervention, whether you're working on co very complex issues like climate change, poverty reduction, et cetera, is really creating the space to bring in as many perspectives as possible into the conversation, and even you know, be able to put yourself in a posture of humility where you're not we, we talk a lot about this, and you know we've we've gotten very much more comfortable recognizing that we don't have the answers to everything. But as a colleague, Leah from NBC was, you know, I, I said I, 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 I want to quote her. She said this morning, "It's much more difficult feeling being comfortable with being wrong about something." And so, being able to invite that 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 conversation, change your mind, and recognize the value that, uh, that recognizing the value that others bring. So we'll, when we go into collaboration, it's not just to show off what you have and the solutions you want to bring, really invite and recognize the values of others. So a lot of the work that we do, whether it's designing products, our own investments, et cetera, it's really creating the spaces where you can bring in your investors with your, with your entrepreneurs in the creation of new solutions. If you're going to work on abundantly investing in girls, fans, and gender expansive youth of color across the United States, for instance, working with youth to create the space for them to create that vision, uh, recognize the wisdom that comes from that space. And so really on the piece around the diversity of perspectives is one central one. Um, and the other is really um, also on the interconnectedness, there's the interconnectedness of issues, social, environmental issues, governance issues, a whole range, but the interdependence piece around them. And so one of the things that we're trying to do uh, with our investment funds, for instance, is recognize that you know the value is not being created by just the intermediaries that are identifying the companies. 
the value is being created by the founders, by the entrepreneurs, but in large part by the ecosystems that are nourishing them. And so how do we really, can, can we embed within our, with our investment, um, with our investment thesis, within the profit sharing models, with the, within the, uh, all, the, the, the entire package, a way to recognize um, and, and feed back and, and share back with those ecosystems, which is where really the value is being created so that we can create resilience um, uh, for the future. Let me just pause for a second and pull out a couple of principles we've heard so far before you, if you Jeff, sure. I'm, I'm guessing you'll build on some of these. So one is we heard the idea of thinking about the change makers and how do I create and equip and train the change makers from the professor, uh, the, the, the dean of Howard. Um, Another that you, both of you have mentioned so far is trying to change who makes the decisions is as, a, as a systems level change, as opposed to you know, having all the same people just try to invest differently. We're trying to change who's making the investment decision um, to, to start with. And then you mentioned also um, building the ecosystem, so not just the change makers and not just who's making the decision, but the facilitators, the intermediaries, et cetera, so putting together different components. Go ahead, you wanna build on that? I know you're, that a lot of that is teeing up the work you do, so tell us what you're doing and what's hard about it. Yeah, these people are great. They just say everything that we do, essentially, at Raven. And I think the way that I would start it, and I wanna talk about systems for a second, Go ahead. at least how we're seeing it. Um, that um, the, the way that we drive our work, I think, the way that you put it is we're trying to put evidence into practice. Um, we find it easier to talk to systems decision makers by saying, see, it can work. And the way that we started with that was by creating an indigenous impact investment firm that hadn't existed before, and we pushed uphill against all kinds of systemic racism barriers inside the financial system, and in particular with decision makers. A lot of these investment committees who sit in on funds, fund of funds, and on boards of foundations and other areas are uh, implicitly inherently biased. Um, and you know, I think we're we're suffering what I would call a racial risk premium hmm. as Indigenous people uh, in that space. That said, so talk about systems for a second. So if you're an indigenous person in the world today, your life has been defined by a dominant system, uh, unfortunately. And it's a system that created a level of capital development and extraction, you know, starting to some degree with slavery, uh, to a large degree, and indigenous black slavery, and then development of financial institutions that supported that, and then a kind of self-reinforcing mechanism of resource extraction on top of it, uh, and then, uh, which was finalized by, of course, the taking of land itself, uh, the ultimate resource. And so if you're indigenous today, you see and felt that, and because we do have oral histories, we talk about it in a very real personal sense that it still exists. And so that system is the system of colonization. And inside that colonization system, all kinds of justifications start to happen, both with religious doctrine and then with philosophical and political doctrine about how these things were going to be structured. What are we left with? We're left with this system, how capital markets work today, how uh, governments work today. And that's another part of the system for us that we want to uh, talk about uh, and engage. And if, you know, People actually believed there has actually never been an invisible hand of the market. There's always been tons of human hands creating the markets to do exactly what they do, as uh, both the colleagues have said today. So the way that we are working at Raven is uh, we, we did venture capital funds to start. Uh, we got two venture capital, indigenous venture capital funds at work, and we're trying to do change from the bottom up. We're investing in indigenous businesses who themselves are change makers, and we're providing a kind of we're trying to blanket them, as we would say, and kind of lift them up. But importantly on that, we don't want to do, make the mistakes that have been made in the past. We only take minority positions. We want to leave wealth in the community. That means human and financial wealth in the communities uh, that we're working in. That's the only way that we'll see the broad upliftment that we're seeking. The other part of the system, though, that we noticed while we were doing the venture capital side is um, the complex you know, big, wicked, hairy problems that you talk about in social finance. In particular, we work in climate, climate adaptation and climate change. Indigenous people are on the front lines of that, experiencing it very roughly uh, in most places of the world. 
and uh, on health. And why health? Because we think health of Mother Earth is connected to health of the individual, and it's connected to resilience in community. And you saw this in an extreme version during the pandemic, where our community suffered extraordinarily. I think our, in the broadest sense of our communities across the globe. And when it came to the pandemic, that's because they were not, they were mistreated by and not a, a healthy part of the ecosystem. And if you quote the, uh, uh, Darren's quote about, you know, sort of what percentage is, you know, female-led, black-led, you know, sort of part of, of funds. I can't imagine what the number is for Indigenous, but it's going to be a lot less than that even. Um, and so we kind of look at, at all these systems that are at play. And so we have venture capital on one side, and now we're working on what we call outcomes finance. And I mention it because our approach to outcomes finance is a two-eyed seeing approach. Uh, meaning we see Western science and the things and the gifts that it brings, and we see traditional indigenous and the gifts that it brings, and we think they work together. And actually, I think we've proven that they work together fairly well. We are doing geothermal ground source heat pumps in non-reserve communities. Why are we doing that? Because that's what the community asked for. It's not that we come in there as investors and say, we need to do geothermal. It's, it's more, what is the community telling us that it needs? And it comes back to, I think, uh, something one of you said, I can't remember now who, is that we believe that those closest to the problem actually know how to mm -hmm. fix the problem. It's not someone sitting in Washington, Ottawa, wherever it is, kind of making decisions, which means that you need to approach systems differently. I actually have a point, Jeff. No, uh, in all great. This. But is, Roundly, man. And Just then um, the, uh, so what we've done on outcomes finance, what we realized that we needed to do is we needed to engage public capital in a different way. So we get some credibility by being a private capital placement firm, and we know what we're doing there. We start working on outcomes finance, and we need the government to come along, and we need philanthropy to come along. We need all three. Four. The problems are so large of climate and health and adaptation that we realize that we need them to come along, and we need to change the system. So we're identifying the points that we need to play. As a, we're, a very, we're not a lumen or a second muse. We're a very small player, so we're trying to use our small but mighty team to kind of engage government and have conversations in Canada and now the US about where we think that they can act differently and show up differently. And it's, I know it's kind of trite, but capital needs to show up differently in our communities. And when you do, you get really good outcomes. And you get good commercial outcomes too, by the way. You don't just get good outcomes. And I, I, think, I think to some degree we need to set aside concepts of profit because concepts of profit have gotten us into a bit of a, a bind globally. And we have a lot of people excluded from the system. We have a lot of money moving up to people who want to put low orbit satellites in place and, uh, and move money from, extract money from the lower end of the pyramid and pull it up where it doesn't actually do a lot of good. Uh, you know, trillion dollar valuations on certain technology companies and their place doesn't really help the vast majority of humanity. It doesn't do any good in the money's move, right? So anyways, I'll stop there. How, how um, are you using the same in investment tools, the same investment techniques, the same structures, the same term sheets, et cetera, or are you adapting them? So we're adapting them. So what we've been doing, we've been on this, uh, what we call decolonizing the investment process, journey, not a destination. So every time we do it, it's a bit different. Um, so we, we got into a deal uh, with one of our first uh, portcos, and uh, we did not take preferred shares. Okay. So for a VC firm to not take preferred shares in a deal is kind of interesting, right? You're kind of going against the philosophy. We also do structured exits and structured buybacks so that the entrepreneur knows how to get out of it, and we only need so much capital back. We, we don't need, ex we don't really want unicorns. I don't think we want to lift all up. We don't want to take two or three, you know, the sort of two and 20 approach that VC tech, VC is extraordinarily extractive, by the way. And we chose VC for a purpose because we want to change the extraction stuff. So we're trying to change term sheets. Term sheets. We're trying to double end with legal fees so it comes off of the, the, the founder's legal fees. We did a reverse buyback where an indigenous company so a big company, the software testing, had started a smaller company that was indigenous only, 
and we revert, did a reverse engineering uh, buyback where the small, the mouse ate the elephant and bought the big company through a share transfer. It was complicated structurally, but it worked brilliantly. And now this $40 million a year company is an indigenous owned company. Um, and so we're trying to do things different in this space and create different sort of value. On outcomes finance, we're already starting with what we want to do. Like at the outset, we're saying, let's stabilize A1Cs in this community because type 2 diabetes is a crisis. Ozempic, by the way, won't solve it, just to get that out there. Um, and uh, you need to change the systems of food, of health provision, uh, all of these systems that have been put in place. So it's all of it is a system change approach. Like we can't do one. We have to do, we have to work at all of it all the time. It can be a little bit exhausting, and that's where allies uh, come into play, um, just working together on this. It's good to hear these folks that they lift me up, fill up my cup, as we would say, and keep, keep You must be working with a good team on the outcomes-based financing structures. They're there. They're in the room. Wahi, Rebecca, MJ. Anything else to add on this before we talk about the leadership needed for systems change? Anything no, I was just going to ask... A Jeff, where he gets that we're bigger than you, you're bigger than us right now. Yeah. Speaks to your success, yes. Wow. It's hard to believe because that was only six <laughs> years ago we started. Five years. So let, let's talk now about leadership and the type of leadership needed doing systems change as opposed to just direct one-off um, work. And to set the context um, for this, you know, as, as capital, capitalism is evolving and there's talks of um, stakeholder capitalism and an evolution of, of capitalism to include multiple stakeholders and internalize externalities, et cetera. Um, that's going to require a different form of leadership than the traditional command and control, top down, et cetera. I say that just because systems change also requires it. You can't stand up and say, change, change, do this. You can't, one group person, one group can't just make a decision. Um, it requires collaboration. It requires stakeholder analysis thinking, et cetera. Will you share, let's just go down the line, whoever has a thought first, um, on the leadership needed and the strategy needed to do this type of systems change and what you've learned so far? Whoever wants to go first. You need um Collaboration is a really important piece in all of this um, because, you know, you, you were speaking about one of the principles of, 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 of systems and it's sort of like emergence and typically we see sort of like the, 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 the birds, right, how they're going and there isn't one single leader that is at the top. It's sort of like it's, it, it's, a, living, it's a living body and that's how our systems operate. And, uh, you know, it's it's something about you know within organizations, etc. There's going to be there's going to be leadership, but it's really about how do we make that leadership more inclusive, and open space to collaborate and and maintain sort of like that feedback and that that coordination, in the things that we're working. So, you know, um, in Jeff, your examples and 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 Darren's, your two in terms of how you're 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 managing your funds, but even, you know, who's who is at the table, create, it's not just who's making the decisions, who's creating the products to begin with, and then how do we give the space for continued participation in governance structures and accountability, et cetera, um, uh, more broadly. So sort of like there's for the creation of solutions around the collaboration, but the other one too is, you know, these are massive problems. And to start to think about systems that are much larger than, than, than you is like, how do we get more collaboration between, um, you know, different types of investors. We keep on talking about, you know, foundations, endowments, and sort of like impact investors have a lot of flexibility, are thinking very much advanced there, but limited in scale in the larger scheme of things. We have uh, pension funds and other institutional investors, they have the scale, but not the flexibility, and for many, for, for, for good reasons. So creating the space and sort of like the, the, the leadership to be bringing all of these groups together to think together about how do we, how do we operate in the space, how do we address some of, these, some of these massive issues. And the last thing I'll say is, you know, I think that we can't underestimate 
talking about systems and then really being aware of, of what that means because we sort of like talk, we need to be working on broader systems and then we spend how much time just developing a strategy that is gonna be, lead us to very siloed approach to any one issue. I care about this social issue, I care about this environmental issue and we forget and we don't yet feel comfortable sort of like stepping out and saying, we're gonna work on all of these things recognizing that it's gonna benefit me too and it's gonna benefit my, my, my cause. So I think that collaborate, like genuine collaboration can allow us to maybe start to operate better in, right. in that way. I just jump in really quickly, Darren, before just a, a bit gave me a, a thought. You know, mm -hmm. the, the difference, or maybe if one of you, if one of you know it and want to take it, the difference between something that is complicated. I know Franz will know the answer. Complicated versus complex. Right. A complicated thing has a lot of different moving parts that interact with each other that are all important in the right order. A Ferrari is complex. Right. I mean, it's complicated. Complex is, is more like the birds, where there are independent actors that are interdependent as well, that are moving around. You take a Ferrari apart, you can put it back together. You take a body apart, somebody's body apart, you can't just put it back together and have it function because of the way the, the things, so it's more than just the sum of the parts. So there's this issue of uh, systems change, systems, the type of systems, where human systems yeah. are often complex. Mechanical systems are often complicated. Human systems are often complex because one actor over here can make an independent decision over here that ripples through the system. That actor can make a different, that actor can make a change and so all of them are very difficult. Because of that, somebody can't just say, like I said a moment ago, just change this. We have to find the different nodes and influence them and it's more of an influence, collaboration, listening, getting the right people in there than pure command. Go ahead, Darren. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to build off of um, the conversation here, and um, I think that you know one of the things that's inspiring to me about us coming together um, and the power of coming together in a conference like SoCap to learn is that you know one of my mentors said that learners will inherit the earth, while the learned will. Mm be suited, find themselves suited for a world that no longer exists. So one of the things about private equity and venture capital and growth funds, the areas that we invest into, is that when we arrive with a, a curriculum and toolkit set um, to coach managers on addressing biases in hiring and board selection and looking at their, um, their investment selection process, a lot of times were their first professional development opportunities that they've had within their respective organizations because the learning process is not full um, as it should be. For investors, stopping to learn is, is, is sort of the end of an organization. It's vital, it's the lifeblood of the organization. Learning about areas where there's latent value in the market is sort of the DNA of finding um, outcomes that are solutions that grow prosperity, I think, for communities, for um, organizations, et cetera. So I think that there's this wonderful um, kind of spirit of continuous learning that's part of the overall system and all of the different models that we're sharing and holding up. And um, just wanted to honor that as well. Yeah, can I build yeah please. So it, I was going somewhere else, but this triggered me mm -hmm. to... I sat with some